everybody. Uh, welcome back to Pump Jack. We were here a few weeks ago with Aaron Miller and John Conover. But the question I get more often than not on the road is, do you really put your reserve Cabernet in screw cap and why? So I thought in this time of home isolation, that would be a good idea to get the experts out and, uh, and ask them why. So to that, I want to introduce John Conover and say, what on earth were you thinking in the late 90s? It was a crazy idea. Um, and uh, I wish I could have, we didn't have internet up here in Napa Valley. We still, we have internet, but it doesn't work that well still. But back then, no internet. So we had faxes and the telephone. And um, we decided to bottle uh, not our least expensive wine, but our most expensive wine, uh, the 97 vintage of Plump Jack's Reserve and screw caps. And um, I should have saved these faxes and voicemails. <laughs> Dumb idea. This is never going to work. You're always going to be known as a screw cap guy. Your career is over. God, in the name of the winery, Plum Check, that's another strike against it. What a dumb name. <laughs> and uh, when I go to a restaurant, I apologize up front, what am I going to ask for? What's your screw charge? How is that going to work? <laughs> and um, the reasoning is what was important for us in uh, taking a chance, being entrepreneurial. And the story goes back a number of years before that. Uh, Plum Check started um, in 1993 as a small wine shop in San Francisco, uh, founded by Gavin Newsom and Gordon Getty's son, Bill. Um, and shortly afterwards, we took over the Balboa, Balboa Cafe, Grand Chef Fillmore, best cheeseburger on the planet. Make sure I'm frequent that when we get over this. And then up the street was uh, Plum Jack Cafe. Plum Jack Cafe was an amazing place. Some of the best chefs in San Francisco did uh, uh, stints there. Um, and one thing Gavin wanted to do, like we want to do, is make wine affordable and approachable, something that the regular person can go out and buy and enjoy and not make it this big fancy event. So all the wines at the restaurant were priced at retail price. Unbelievable. Again, you're never going to be able to have a business that's charging wines at retail price. But it, it's been very successful for us in strategy. So like all of us, we have these special wines. These wines we collect for the right moment. Might be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And we had that experience. So. Um, Gordon Getty, one of my partners, had um, some wine from New York that he had shipped back to his home. And there's always the, the uh, bucket list wines, the legendary wines. And in wine dumb, I think, Aaron, you might agree with this. I've never had it, so I only understand it. But the 1947 Cheval Blanc is one of the greatest wines ever made. And Gordon Blanc had a 47 Cheval Blanc. The last bottle of 47 Cheval Blanc in his wine case. So went down to the Plum Jack Cafe, had a great meal put together, ready to celebrate how great this wine is, and pulled the cork out, and guess what? It was corked. Cork in TCA. Uh, the worst. Almost started crying. It was that, that bad. Uh, the buildup was so unbelievable. And Aaron's going to talk a little about the science behind it, um, on why we did screw cap and what TCA is, and what you are taught at the University of California, Davis, our partnership with them. We'll do that after the tasting. Uh, but we tasted the wines and it was cork tainted. And Gordon, who is just a curious human being, asked the important question, why is that okay? So what do you mean, why is that okay? Why is it okay that you guys work so hard to grow the grapes? Plump Jack comes from the 50 acres you see behind us. And we work so hard for an entire year to get one crop of grapes. Then the grapes arrive in the fall after Aaron decides when to pick, and the wines are made in our cellar, Courtney and, and Aaron and his team, and are barrel aged for 18 months. A lot of work goes besides that during the aging process. So we put it in a bottle, and then a closure, a chunk of cork, a 200 year old technology ruins this bottle of wine. And you might not know it for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So it was a really important question that Gordon. Um, ask, why is that okay? Is there something better? Um, at the time, no one did anything besides quarks in the really higher end, the collectible market. And um, I said, well, let me look into it. Let's see what we have out there. So at the time, there was quarks, there was synthetic quarks, um, there were plastic quarks, and there were screw caps. 
at the time, and probably still today, a number of you out there think of screw cap wine as um, like hip flask, MD2020 Nitrain. You probably never heard of that, but they're all screw cap finished by E.J. Gallo. Um, and so I started looking around for closures that met the need. And we kind of started crossing off the synthetics, uh, the conglomerate forks, um, and got to screw cap. And all of the objections for screw cap were based around marketing perception. And that's not a reason not to do something. So Gordon said, my God, John, we have to try this. So um, went out looking for bottles. At the time, the only bottle you could get was um, a hip flask bottle. They only made bottles for inexpensive, cheap wines, cheap, sweet wines. So realized that we're going to have to kind of reinvent the wine industry, take a chance, change things, uh, re-examine closures. So went to, had a bottle design here in Napa Valley, went to Italy and had it made, um, shipped over here, and we bottled the 1997 uh, Plum Jack Reserve Cabernet, half in screw cap, half in cork finish. Big, big, big chance. And as I think during our last uh, visit, we talked about innovation, change, risk taking, um, how California, Northern California, Napa Valley embraces that. Because we're really right now on generation number one. If you think about it, really the modern wine industry is from the 50s or 60s on. We've had 19 wineries in the late 60s. We're up to 550, um, a little larger than pre-prohibition. So we're inventing our legacy, our history, our traditions here. So we don't have it. So it allows us to experiment. That's what's allowed Napa to be Napa in such a short period of time. Access to technology, capital, and these great grapes around us, and winemakers like Aaron Miller. Um, so we had these bottles made, shipped over, we bottled them, um, and at the Nap Valley Wine Auction, those of you saw some of the earlier Facebook posts, there's a picture of myself, Gavin Newsom, who had dark hair at the time, now gray as you can imagine why, and uh, the great uh, Robert Mondavi, a legend, we could do a whole talk on Robert Mondavi. And we said, Robert, he greeted us at the Nap Valley Wine Auction, we're just about to release our Plum Jack Reserve Cabernet, we're this young upstart winery that's trying to figure it out. I said, Robert, we're going to bottle our reserve Cabernet with screw caps. He looks at me, the ultimate innovator, the ultimate uh, quality oriented human being. And he goes, I'm glad it's you and not me. And that marketing perception was where he was coming from. Not that it wasn't a better closure, but the perception from the public. And it was, it was very emotional stills for people. Some people like it, some people hate it. There's no right and there's no wrong. That's why we make half of it in screw cap, half in cork finish. So if cork is your jam, go with cork. If screw cap's your jam, go with the screw caps. Um, so we bottle this wine up, 300 cases, and release it to the world. Um, and it changed the wine world. Nowadays, a white wine is accepted with screw caps. Before that moment, no one bottled wines with screw caps because it was cheap wine. So all of our white wines are bottled with screw cap. Now so many of our neighbors here um, are bottling their white wines with, with screw caps. Red's a different story, slower to be accepted because red wines age much longer than whites and people are still concerned and nervous about that. So I rolled this out and I thought, oh, we're gonna study it internally. I said, well, people are gonna say, John, you're gonna come up with a decision, conclusion that screw caps are better because you're doing screw caps. So I said, we need to get a third party to do a research study, it's not one year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, to see how screw caps and corks age side by side. Um, and the only skin in the game we have with University of California in Davis, one of the great winemaking schools in the world, is we donate wines um, in a small stipend to have them research this, but we don't get involved with any bias. And there have been some reports that Aaron will talk about that have come out. Because I want a third party to come say, it's the worst idea ever, screw caps, will never work, or they're a great idea and more people should consider it. So we went up to UC Davis, donated some wine, they studied every year, we released it to the world, and it was so well received. Um, and I thought about it, and why was it so well received? Number one, we eliminate TCA, I guess something else we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, number two, um, it, it, it was about, it's about what's in the bottle. Um, it's about the grapes, the winemaker, and that wine in the bottle. And I'm proud to say we make pretty darn good wines here at Plum Jack Gate of Debt. And we wanted the wine to speak for itself. So I think we had the credibility of screw caps, of Plum Jack, of our vineyards, that helped make it more palatable for the general public. 
But again, those of you out there that hate screw caps, I, I, I love you. I will still love you. And that's not a good or bad thing. Um, we, like, we like screw caps and corks. Hence, we use both here at the winery. Um, so it's been a long and winding road with that. Um, Aaron, how many 100-point scores have you gotten from the great Robert Parker? Three. Three. So he's gotten three 100-point scores from the great Robert Parker. And what will the wine bottle under? Half screw cap, half cork finish. And as proud as he is of the wines he makes, he would not close, put closures on these bottles unless he had confidence in them. And we always submit our wines to uh, Parker or any other critics on the screw cap. Those 100 point wines were uh, on the screw cap. So that's kind of how we've gotten here. So Odette, Reserve Cabernet, 50 50 screw cap cork finish. Uh, the great Cade Cabernet upon Al Mountain made by Daniel Sorrell. Right behind us here, 50-50 screw cap cork. And we want to invite you to participate in our experiment. So we offer it one bottle of screw, one bottle of cork. And hopefully some of you out there are doing this little experiment right now, because we're about to do it with you too and make fools out of ourselves. Um, we want you to open these blind. Put them in a brown paper bag, wrap them in foil, so you don't, you're not biased. And taste them side by side. See if you can tell the difference. Because again, wine, there's no right or wrong. It's what your perception is of what you enjoy, the flavors you like. Um, so it's been a really fun exercise for us. And the wines do change over time. So, first, cheers. Plum Jack Reserve Chardonnay. This is the 2018? The 18. 18, the tail end of that. We're just about to release the 19, which is bottled. Uh, came from a couple of great vineyards here in the Napa Valley. No malactic cream, clean, elegant, crisp, nice acidity. Um, I call it um, palate cleanser and a wine just to wake your palate up and get ready for some good red wines. Uh, my daughter Katie calls it a pregame wine. So depending on um, if you're under 30, it might be pregame. For us, it's a way to cleanse our palate. Great wine, fish, shellfish, um, just a wonderful Chardonnay. So, cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. You know, one of, the things, one of the things I like to think about with cork finish Aaron Miller makes this wine. He works on this wine for three years. So you're in the vineyard, and then two years in the cellar, you get a bottle, you put a piece of tree bark, really, into the bottle, and that could ruin it. Just the closure. So I often use the analogy, if Tide detergent ruined your clothes four, five, six percent of the time because of the packaging, wouldn't you at least consider a different package? So, I really salute you, John, for your courage. In the late 90s, it must have seemed completely insane to try this. Uh, but I, I salute your courage and your innovation. Oh, well, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. That's it. If you, being satisfied um, is a recipe for not being innovative and continue to be successful. So, each year we sit down with our vineyard manager, Dave Perio, with Aaron, Danielle, and Jeff. And this man's made 300 point park for one. I said, Aaron, how are you going to do it better next year? How are we going to make better wines? And that's part of the culture of our organization. Um, we, we take our winemaking and grape growing seriously, but we don't necessarily take ourselves too seriously. But what has to do with the grape growing and the winemaking, we have to be great. We have to be in the great business. And Aaron, every year, raises that bar. I don't know, does Parker give a 105 point score? Yeah. You deserve that, Aaron, 105 point score, but each year hopefully our wines get better and better. People say, well, the older wines, what was your favorite? I have many favorites, but each year the wines you make uh, are better than the previous year. So. Yeah, thank you. Well, and I think also, ultimately it's you that we don't want to let down. So we work so hard on these wines to, to be a part of your celebration, to be a part of your dining room table. And if you open our wine and it's corked, it's heartbreaking for you and it's heartbreaking for us. Yeah, and we're, we're consumers too, and uh, so we understand both. We're in the wine industry, obviously, uh, from a winemaking perspective, as Sandra alluded to earlier. Uh, I, I worked for a couple of years making these wines. My team works for a couple of years making these wines, and it's disappointing when we release these wines and they're not uh, as we intended, when they're false, or uh, another uh, fault that you can have in foreclosures besides uh, fork paint is just oxidation, just a uh, bad cork, uh, and that variation you can get from bottle to bottle. And we want the wine to be as we intend it to be. But then also as a consumer, I'm, I'm disappointed when I open a bottle of wine and it's prematurely over the hill or it has cork paint. Uh, 
Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, where we're coming from on both sides, from production and from a consumer point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's, what else is on the table here, or shall we say the wine barrel? Um, we're going to do a blind tasting. We're going to put ourselves out there uh, and taste. We don't know what's in these glasses. Uh, we're going to write down our answers uh, to which one, what vintage we're guessing, as well as what, uh, which wine is screw cap and which wine was finished under cork. Uh, we do know that it is Plum Jack Reserve Cabernet. So many. Well, we know, yeah. No cheating. No cheating. <laughs> Any questions while we're tasting? Yep, somebody asked um, how if, if you can store them any differently than you would uh, with a, a cork. That's a great question, Aaron. Uh, you don't have to store them any differently. You still want the temperature to be pretty constant, whatever your temperature is, uh, preferably cooler temperatures uh, in the mid 50s. Uh, a cork, you want to lay down, obviously. A screw cap, you can lay down, but you can also stand up. There's no cork to keep, to keep wet. Uh, so you don't have to worry about laying it down. But most of our, our cellars or wine fridges are designed for laying bottles down anyway. So you don't really have to store them any differently. I have my guess. You all have yours? I do too. I haven't tasted yet. I wish you guys were here to taste with us. Uh, Soon. Soon. emotional. Um, uh, people that come up and uh, just, they'll never get their minds around screw cap and cork. My father was one of them. Um, he grew up from a very young man uh, drinking wine, only cork finish. And he loved the ceremony, the romance of popping that cork out and looking at the vintage and smelling the cork. And I totally understand that. Um, but then again, younger people, younger generations of people look at change and innovation as being a good thing. Um, they're not stagnant in their evolution in wine. They, a lot of people start off with sweeter wines and go to drier wines. And younger demographics look at improvements and closures as being a positive thing. Um, if you can eliminate, I think statistically it's three to four percent of wines, because we don't know. We ship our wines out to you whether it's in the Cayman Islands, in Puerto Rico, in Europe, Asia, all over the US, Canada, or Mexico, and we hope our wines are not corked when they leave. It's a hope because we can't test every cork. Um, and we know, though, that when we ship them out under screw cap, that they're the way that Aaron or Danielle or Jeff wanted them made. Um, so that's a, a guarantee that's not going to be affected by PCA. Yeah. But yeah, it's still very emotional for people, as this is for me. Anytime you change something, everybody loves change until it affects you. Kind of like what we're going through now shelter in place and so forth. The people that innovate, change, evolve, I think will be, this is make it better for everybody. But someone had to be the guinea pig. And we weren't afraid to be the guinea pig. And we weren't afraid to fail. Um, so this experiment, Gordon's ex crazy experiment, as we call it, will go on forever. They want to know if you ever considered using um, a synthetic or artificial cork. Well, when we were looking into them, and again, this was in 1997, 1998, 1999. Um, at the time, uh, the synthetics, they're kind of like plastic uh, slugs. Um, part of the beauty of cork is a rebounding. We compress it, we put it in the neck, it rebounds, and in theory provides a seal that doesn't let the liquid out. Temperature can affect that, a lot of things can affect that humidity. Um, the synthetics you'd compress and put in the neck of the bottle and it would rebound so much that you couldn't get out of the bottle. You'd actually crack the neck of the bottle. And I can tell you when I'm at home, I don't want to look like an idiot by cracking the neck off the, the top of the bottle. Um, so there was almost an immediate pushback from the trade, Somalis, 
and a consumer is too hard to get out of the bottle. Um, so we eliminated that immediately. Um, there were the synthetics where they take ground pieces of cork and they bind them together with glue. Um, and what we were finding back then as we were experimenting is the glue at the time actually imparted some flavor and it's still cork so you might only get 10% of those particles might have some TCA and you didn't eliminate the TCA issue completely. Again, 100% of the feedback, the pushback against screw caps um, are because of the perception. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people like, we have a shout out to the great state of Texas, lots of good friends out there. We have, a, and it's not legal to do, so don't endorse this, but uh, one of our good uh, customers, after work comes home, and I love this Texas, he gets in his pickup truck, right? And he goes out oh, yeah. to his ranch. And he likes to go shoot some, uh, uh, some doves. And he claims it only happens once he gets on his ranch in his pickup truck. He goes, it's so nice because I like to drink your wine and go drive around looking for the dove in the truck. I go, you shouldn't be doing that, but he's doing it anyways. He it's goes, his ranch. It's his ranch, yeah, so he's not on public streets. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but um, the great thing he does, he goes, the great thing is I don't use a corkscrew. What other beverage requires you to use a tool to open? I mean, the beer guys, we love our beer our brothers out there, um, but they realized a long time ago, you go to twist off cap, and you might have some more customers out there, uh, us wine guys and gals, it's taking a little bit longer to get there, but you eliminate the use of a tool too, which is another benefit of, of screw caps. Yeah, yeah. Yes, oh, we have two, we have lots of questions. Lots of questions. <laughs> How do you determine which wine will get a screw cap versus pork? Well, all, all of our white wines get screw cap across the board. So we have been doing that for quite some time now. We did some experimentation with that up front initially as well, half core, half screw cap, but uh, we, we found that they really held up well with the screw cap. They stayed fresher longer and they're just beautiful wines. Uh, and as far as the, the, the red wines, we started this in the 1997 vintage with the Reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it was like a go big or go home. And uh, that was Gordon's crazy experiment. And we did half cork, half screw cap. And since then, we've just been trialing it in some of the other wines. We do just about 5% of the estate Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and right now, I don't do any of the Merlot or Syrah. I've only done some trials with it that I have in the cellar that we're just uh, tasting every now and then just to see how they are. Uh, but this goes back to what John was saying earlier. It's about the public perception. And it's actually easier for us to sell our reserve Cabernet Sauvignon in a screw cap than it is our Merlot or Syrah or Cabernet, estate Cabernet Sauvignon in a screw cap. Uh, we just have that loyal, uh, loyal consumer that keeps coming back with that reserve Cabernet Sauvignon. They know us, they know the quality that we're, that we're giving to them, and they trust that we're going to give them that high quality, whether it's cork or screw cap. Well, one of the things I've found in tasting some of, being lucky enough to taste some of these older vintages is that cork ages more quickly and screw cap tends to age more slowly. So when I, when I give advice, when people ask me, I say drink your cork, age your screw caps for a number of reasons. Number one, it'll age slowly, but number two, it will not break your heart if you open it in 30 years to celebrate your son's medical degree. It will not yeah. be cork. My, my perception when I started at Plum Jack in 2012, uh, so I came from some other wineries that did not use screw caps. Uh, and like many other wineries in Napa Valley and California and the world, I really looked down on the screw cap. And so uh, I was a little bit concerned coming in. It's like, really, we're, gonna, we're using screw caps <laughs> on a reserve cab? And so I thought, you know, I was going to have to tell a dishonest story about how I love the screw cap. And I learned quickly that that's not the way we, we operate here. We're, you know, we're always honest. And, uh, and I, and I, saw really quickly by doing some side-by-side -side tastings like this that the wines were different and I I thought the story was the wines are the same no matter what closure they're in and that's not the case and that's not that's not the story what I found really is what Sandy was just saying that the screw cap actually seems to age a little slower has a little freshness longer uh, whereas the cork starts to develop those tertiary characters more the dried fruits and herb and uh, some of the t tobacco, cigar box, cedar uh, characters earlier than the screw cap. But that screw cap wine is still evolving, still aging, still gaining complexity and depth, uh, and it's a really beautiful wine. It takes a little longer to get there. So like Sandra said, 
I drank my pork early and I ate the screw cap. And I think the common misconception is that people feel that a screw cap won't age. Can you talk a little bit about the oxygen transfer rate between corks and the liners that you're using yeah. for screw caps? Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll go, we'll do a little tech. We'll get to the, we'll get to that question. I see you guys have a question. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we were almost talking about was some of the studies we've done with UC Davis, some of the wines that we donate to them. We actually donated some Sauvignon Blanc from Cade a number of years ago, and we bottled that under corks, screw cap, and the, the uh, synthetic cork. And uh, we gave that to them to study oxygen transfer rates. That's the amount of air and oxygen that goes through or around the cork. The dirty still out on how it gets there, and uh, gets absorbed into the wine. And they did this in a way where they wouldn't have to open the wine to measure those rates. They actually were able to measure the oxygen transfer rates based on other studies that where they were able to test the, check the color of the wine, the browning, browning pigment developing in the wine, and know how much oxygen is actually entering the wine. And so uh, each closure lets oxygen through the bottle, but at slightly different rates. And while this study wasn't necessarily to, to check those rates and test those rates, what we do know is generally uh, screw cap is a slower rate of oxygen transmission and cork is generally a little higher. Uh, your tightest cork, tightest cork will be uh, slower rates and your looser cork will be higher rates. And so there is a little bit of variation. And that's really what the study did at UC Davis. They were studying variation within a closure, not they weren't really studying the closures compared to one another. Uh, what they found was that the cork had the highest variance of oxygen transmission rates, so there's more bottled water variation, and the synthetic and the screw cap had the least uh, variance, so that the uh, least bottled of bottle variation is their closure. Well, if I'm right on my pick, you can even see it in the color of the wine. But I can't stand it anymore, y'all. Can we please have the reveal, or do we need to tell sure. our answer? We have to tell our answer. We can tell first. our answers first here. Okay. You ready to display? Ready. Darren. What did you say, Aaron? John and I said the same thing. I said oh, we all first. Screw cap first. I said 2013. I said oh. 2013. John said 13. You say 11. I say 11. But we all got the cork, and we all agree on the cork and screw cap. So, Aaron. Well, wine one. Wine one is over there. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I'll do the big reveal. So the vintage is yes. 10. 2010. Ten. Sales lady gets the closest. 2010. And what's the closure? What's the closure? Screw cap. Yep. Screw cap. Oh my god, Oops. we all got that wrong. We're all wrong. See, we're all wrong. 2010. Court. Court. Wow. So, who knows? Hard we don't know. Tell. Uh, I thought, I personally, so my, I didn't write down my notes, I thought they were very similar, but I actually thought that the, uh, in this instance, I thought the first wine, is this the first wine? Yeah. This wine one? Um, was, uh, had a little bit more of the oak character. And so I thought it had a little bit more of the tertiary character coming through. Exactly. Whereas this one I thought had, it was a little tighter on the nose. Yep. And I thought that the, um, that tightness on the nose would be from the screw cap. Yep. Wow. You don't know. Fooled all of us. Winemaker, sales lady, and owner. <laughs> but I think usually for these wines, it, it happens at about 10 years that they start to diverge. So usually, I mean, this is 2010, so it hasn't quite been a decade. So I can see why we would all, they were very similar. And that's, that's the point, really, isn't it? Oh, Instagram. What's the failure rate for screw caps? And then a follow-up question is, how do you use a Corbin with a screw cap? Uh, well, we I don't know a failure rate. They are, you know, we do a lot of testing on the bottling line to test the, you know, the, the threading and the torque to take off the screw cap and to break the bridges and all that kind of stuff on the screw cap. So uh, we don't really have a, a much reported failure. Um, I've never heard of any reported failure, really. And what you do have to be careful of when you have a screw cap is flipping your cases upside down because you can damage your uh, the screw cap and you can dent it and then create a, a way for air to get in more quickly. Uh, as far as the Stelvin goes, or for the uh, Corbin goes, for the, uh, the screw cap, there were, I think it's like kind of a beta 
kind of model, but uh, Corbin has made a actual screw cap where you need to take off the screw cap of the, of the wine, but then you thread on a Corbin screw cap that you can puncture with your Corbin. Mm -hmm. So you actually do have to remove the screw cap first, uh, so you might have a little initial um, kind of oxygen ingress, and then you put on that Stelvin screw cap, or the Corbin, rather, screw cap closure, and then you have the Corbin. And we do offer them the taste room, so those of you that are interested in, in the Corbin package with, for screw caps, we do offer those to the taste room. But really, I think, invite three friends over and drink the bottle. Yeah, exactly. Oh, face the next question. So, uh, fellow winemaker Danielle Soro wants you to talk about um, Saranex versus Tin um, and different grades of screw cap. So, uh, Danielle has been doing some uh, experimentation at Cade, and that's something that I wanted to do this year. She did some experimentation with both her uh, Estate Cabernet Sauvignon and her Sauvignon Blanc with different types of liners inside of the uh, closure. So, oops, excuse me. So in here, there's a liner, and you can, there's different grades of liners, different types of liners that have different uh, oxygen transmission rates. The tightest is a tin liner, and so that will let less oxygen or less air through the liner and into the wine. Uh, you can get Serenex, which is another material that actually lets a little bit more oxygen in, and there are uh, a wide range of grades that you can use, so you can really fine tune your oxygen transmission rates. And so some of the uh, experimentation that she's done uh, up at Cade, she's been able to identify which liner she prefers with her wines, which works best with her Sauvignon Blanc and uh, with her uh, estate, Cabernet Sauvignon. And so that is something that I have not done here. I've just gone, gone with what we've always gone with because I've liked the results. But I've thought more recently that I should uh, try doing that here as well. So this year we're going to get some other liners and do some experimentation with that as well. Aaron, is there anything you can do to, if a wine has been um, cork painted, to bring it back? No, not really. They, some people will have said you can decant over with saran wrap because the, the PCA, which is tricolor anisole, that molecule, combines the different plastics and different resins. Um, in the cellar, if it happens in the cellar, uh, I think you can treat it with some sort of filtration process where you run your wine through a resin that would remove it. But obviously, you don't want to do that. And it can you can have low low uh, level uh, cork paint in a cellar as well because it's it comes from oak, it comes from the bark of an oak tree, and we use oak barrels. And sometimes you can have a bad state in a barrel. It, since 2009, when I started uh, really uh, evaluating barrels and smelling every barrel for every racking, uh, I've only found four barrels, uh, you know, out of thousands and thousands that have had that problem. So it's not a common issue. Uh, I couldn't imagine we'd really need to run an entire production through that process. Does cork taint? Uh, is it? It doesn't make you sick. It doesn't hurt you. No, no. It, it just ruins wrong. your wine. Well, so you could, if you're in the sangria mood, you can make sangria out of it, probably, and cover Maybe. mask the flavors. Yeah, if you want to put a $300 bottle of wine in there, sangria. Yeah, if, if, yeah. if you want to put some stuff in sangria. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, 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 but it's not going to hurt you. Uh, TCA doesn't hurt you physically. Well, what causes TCA, Aaron? Well, so TCA is a byproduct of basically a, a mold on pork. Uh, and Mold, uh, I believe so. It's, a, it's on the tree, and so what can happen is this mold can be exposed to different chemicals like chlorine or bromine or uh, you know, different chemicals in that family, and those are toxic to this, to this mold. And so what it does is when it takes it in, it changes it, and it turns it into something that's non-toxic. So it takes that chlorine and turns it into something called trichloro anisole. And that trichloro anisole ends up on the cork, and then you put that cork in the wine, and now your wine starts pulling it out of the cork, and it's your wine. And it just has a, uh, I, I always think it smells like an old corn of You know, it's just, yeah. it, it's a, a pungent, terrible smell, 
and that's when it's at its highest concentrations. When it's at low concentrations, you don't really smell it very much, and it actually gets, it can just make your wine smell less forward, less fruity. Uh, you just don't have much aromatics, it just mutes everything. And so you just feel like you have a, a wine that is just not very interesting. And that's one of the most dangerous things when you're, from our perspective, when we're selling wines and somebody has court tannin wines, uh, and they they associate plump jack with this kind of blah, you know, it's not very good, it doesn't have much uh, character, aromatic profile, uh, it's just, you know, it's not a very high quality wine. That hurts us a lot more than if the wine is obviously cork tainted and uh, somebody can call us up and say, hey, I have a cork tainted wine, uh, can you help me out here? Yeah. So I often get, my, my descriptor for cork taint is wet cardboard. Yeah. Dirty, wet cardboard. And if that happens, do we, do we take this wine back? Send it back. We are. We want to make you happy. Um, you are what keeps us in business. Yeah. So if you ever have a bottle of wine for whatever reason that doesn't meet your standards, uh, please send it back. We'll replace it. We'll refund your money. But we stand behind everything we do. Um, and that's such a good point you made about not liking the wine. Just getting rolling the, the clock back here to that tasting at the Plum Jack Cafe. Uh, we were sitting there thinking that we knew what we were tasting. And it'd be the saddest thing would be for someone to taste wine say they don't like wine. Mm. That'd be horrible for everybody. A second that they didn't like that brand of wine, Plum Jack, Cato, Dead, or whatever you else you drink. Um, uh, or, or thirdly, that of uh, restaurateurs, that we didn't store the wine properly. Um, so we get sent back maybe 20, 30 bottles a year. And I'm hoping that's all the corks that were ever bad. But I know the reality is, on a percentage basis, there are more of those out there. So again, you ever taste a wine that doesn't meet your standards, let us know, ship it back. Or, like with this wine here, we taste our older vintages on a regular basis. And um, give the winery a call if you don't know whether the 2010 is ready to drink. Give us a shot here at the winery. Someone at the winery, Aaron, uh, Courtney, the assistant winemaker, can tell you to drink or hold uh, the wine. So again, something we like to do for people so they don't have their last bottle of 2010 open and say, wow, I wish I would have aged another five or 10 years. Okay. Yeah. How about, uh, Instagram. What is the cost difference between using screw cap versus cork? And do the large format bottles come in screw top? Great question. That was another one of the objectives, objections we had. That John, you're doing it because you're cheap. You're saving <laughs> money. What does a reserve cork cost? Uh, about 25. So each cork, cork, $1.25 a piece. Huge expense per case, just corks. Um, so when we wanted to do screw caps, um, again, we had to have 10,000 cases worth of bottles made because the fire up a glass plant, you can't do it for 300, which was our first vintage. So we had to buy, what, 30 years worth of glass in theory? Wow. Long time worth of glass, not that much. Then screw caps, the minimums were very high. So all in all, this, between design, between production, um, it was about $125,000 investment for us to do 300 cases. The math makes no sense. We're in agriculture, so <laughs> this is a tough business to get your mind around with Mother Nature and all these variables involved. Um, but for us, it wasn't about saving costs. If you're looking to save money, the most cost-effective way would have been just to use cork finished bottles, a non-custom bottle, and what's the cheapest cork? Ten cents? Oh, you can get them really cheap, yeah. Ten cent cork. Those, yeah, if it was about saving money, cork. we would have gone that route. For us, this was the most expensive route to go, because we really believed, we, we felt it was an important experiment to do. As far as large formats go, we the only large format that we do is our Chardonnay Magnus. We do that with Street Cap. Uh, but that's the same size neck as the Chardonnay um, uh, 750s. So you don't have to change the spelled and the closure, the uh, screw cap closure. Uh, I'm not aware that they make a larger diameter screw cap for uh, 3 liters or 6 liters for a cabinet. Oh, we've got more questions. Facebook. Uh, which one's more eco friendly, cork or screw cap? I think there's, there's a lot of debate around that. And I don't really know because there's so many variables. 
uh, a lot of the uh, cork producers and uh, people that use cork would argue cork, obviously, uh, because it comes from a, re a reasonable source from the tree, uh, where they don't actually have to cut down the trees to make these corks. They just peel the bark off, and then, uh, you know, after growing a tree for 30 years, peel the bark off. Ten years later, peel the bark off. Ten years later, peel the bark off, and you get the, you get corks each time. So. Uh, you do have a renewable resource, which is nice. Um, you have a recyclable resource with the with the um, the tin uh, closures, the uh, the screw caps, aluminum rather. Um, and uh, then there's also where they're made, and you know the carbon footprint of where the, how far they are being shipped, which is an uh, unknown variable to me really. Um, but one of the things that I like to point out on these bottles here. This one's the screw cap over here. I don't know if you can see that. And this one is the cork here. And what most people forget is that like 99.9% .9 of producers, I'm not just pulling that out. I don't know what that's accurate. When they have the cork closure over here, they also use a tin foil on it. So you're not getting rid of the, that metal element even when you are using a cork. Uh, so both of these, that one has aluminum closure. This one has tin here and a cork. So when you consider that, most uh, wine producers are using this foil. Uh, I don't know that there's a, an, an environmental benefit to one or the other. I'm going to add to it, and I'm going to admit my bias. I like screw caps. So I'm going <laughs> to tell you the screw caps are greener. Um, most cork trees are grown in Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Uh, they cut the bark off the tree. They transport it via truck, probably a diesel truck, to a factory in Spain um, to flatten the corks out and in most instances punch them out of that piece of bark. Then they're transported to the Port of Lisbon, I'm making this part up, and they're put on a ship and shipped uh, to the Port of Oakland um, through this, the canal there, the um, Panama Canal. Then they're trucked up to a facility in South Napa or over in uh, Vallejo or Vacaville. Um, they're uh, branded with plump jack and the vintage on it. Then they're trucked here uh, to Oakville. Um, so you can and they're done, measure that carbon footprint right there. Um, in a lot of cases, the screw caps are made here locally. So they're made down in Marion Canyon and that from recycled materials in our truck. Um, American Canyon, if you don't know, is in Napa County. South Napa. And they're trucked here to the winery for um, application on the bottle. So um, you can make, I think, a valid argument that, that the screw caps are probably a greener, um, greener uh, closure. I know. Um, yeah, before we did, there's no competition, and competition makes you better. You can of competition. And there's an outfit called the Cork Quality Council. It's the marketing and the lobbyist firm for the cork industry. And no competition. You don't need this organization. Now they have this organization because people have a choice. Screw caps are corks. And I know they have. Um, billboards that say um, the only true closure, the most natural closure is cork. I don't know exactly what that means. What does that phrase really mean? Um, I do have to know, however, that we use probably 50-50 corks of screw caps. So we're still in the cork business. We still love all our cork brothers and sisters and importers. Um, and we want them to clean up the TCA issue. It's in your benefit, it's in our benefit, and it has been cleaned up because of competition. It's going to be a yeah. thing. Yeah, but when, when they started this experiment, Gordon's crazy experiment back in the late 90s, uh, wine spectators, um, from wine spectators' publications and from their tastings, uh, they estimated that anywhere between six, seven, eight percent of all wines that were finished with a cork had TCA cork tank. That's, that's one bottle out of every case. So it was really rampant at that time. And since then, they, since, since the competition was just too crap and, uh, and that sort of thing, and they have really made some efforts to clean that up, and now they're down to about 2 to 4%, which is great. Uh, that are, and they're also doing some new technologies where they can test every single port, and they can basically guarantee TCA three ports. Uh, they don't. They can't do that fast enough to do every cork that's being used. Unfortunately, uh, and the other problem is that it doesn't get really any variation from bottle to bottle. That issue, uh, where the screw cap.
that doesn't have any variance in one ball to the next. The court still has, uh, according to that study, UC Davis, an 8% variation for any one of the percentage of the next. And you can have a premature aging in uh, one from one ball to the next. Instagram. With the demand of corks in the wine industry, is there a possibility that we could over-harvest the natural resource of cork trees and run out? I, I, I guess it could be a possibility, but I don't know. I don't know how many trees and forests that they have and how extended they are right now. I really don't know enough about the cork industry in Portugal and Spain and Italy to to answer that. So from a business standpoint, purely business standpoint. You can imagine if um, there's some great two buck chucks out there um, that at a dollar fifty uh, cork, they can't use that. The economics don't make any sense. So I think economic pressure will kick in if the demand of corks keeps going up, that um, the price will go up, and hence that that winery that sells two three dollar bottle of wine won't be able to afford to have a cork in it, and hence more screw cap. Or else they'll just plant more cork, cork trees. They'll take olives or whatever they're growing in these fields and put more cork, cork trees. But as Aaron said, it takes 30 years to get your first harvest, and then yeah. another 30 years. Ten years. Another 10 years for the next harvest. So and the, and the first harvest is in for uh, wine corks because the bark grows so unevenly that that first harvest you actually use for soles of shoes, floors, insulation, uh, any other number of products, but not for a wine cork. So the second harvest and on, you can use for a wine cork. So it's a good 40 years before you can use a, a, a tree for a wine cork. I imagine they've been playing it out though. They say oh, romantic. <laughs> I mean, I think at the end of the day, it matters what you like the best. And that's, that's the thing about wine. Um, our opinion is only that, our opinion. But what we want to offer you is something that is as Aaron intended. Yeah. And, and, we, and we know that the uh, major um, pushback really is public perception. You know, that everything else really works for this wine. Like here we could we could barely tell the difference between these two wines. As Sandra was saying, when you get further out in age, you know, 12, 15, 20 years, you can start really seeing a difference. And um, uh, but you know, so for, as far as our standpoint, what we're giving to you, uh, we know that these are both going to be excellent, excellent wines. Um, and really, it's public perception that is is pushing back on the industry. And uh, you know, John and, and Gordon and, and Gavin have been brave enough and courageous enough to uh, push against that and to be innovative and to try something different to what they thought would be the best for the wine. And I think that we're really seeing that it is really good for the wines. Um, and we understand that there's that romanticism behind popping a cork and, uh, and, and having that wine served to you at the table. Uh, I, I always feel though that once the glass of wine is in front of you, you forget that a cork was pulled or or the spirit cap was open. Uh, you, what you're thinking about is what's in the glass. And what's important is that the quality is preserved in the glass. Uh, passionately pursuing excellence is never going to be the wrong decision. So lots of fans on here, lots of Plump Jack fans. Um, this particular person has the 08, 09, and 10 Plump Jack Estate in their collection um, under cork, and they want to know which if they should be drinking any of those right now. Yeah, you can start with the 08. Um, I think they're probably all tasting really well right now. This is this is delicious. The 10 uh, Reserve right now is tasting really well. Um, and I think it's probably a, a personal preference. If you like wines that are a little fresher, then it's time to start drinking them. If you like them to have a little more evolved character, then you might want to wait a little longer. I usually drink my wines between, these wines here, between 8 to 12 years. Uh, so you're, you're like right in that, right in that sweet spot. After vintage or after release? Vin after vintage. Yeah. I think all those wines have been tasting really well. And I, I would start with the other. And decant, decant, decant. Invest in a nice decanter. Uh, the older the wine, uh, the quicker you can drink it after being decanted, like almost immediately. But if you uh, acquire some 16 or 17 pump jack, state or reserve, hour, two hours, three hours in the decanter. Um, and again, 
don't believe me? Get two bottles, do one decanted, and one pop and park and drink it, and I guarantee you'll think they're two different wines. I guarantee you'll like the two decanted better than non decanted. So it's going to be more open. Not because you had the first one. Exactly. And those of you that are <laughs> trying this experiment along with us, I'd love to hear back and see yeah. what you guys feel about the, the cork and the screw cap. If you were able to tell a difference, if you knew which was which, um, you know, sometimes we taste them and we can tell an obvious difference, and sometimes we're like, hey, sometimes we're completely wrong. So um, I would love to, to hear your feedback. which was the smallest vintage in many, many years at Plump Jack and Odette for us because of uh, the fires. Um, we had to sell off um, over half of our wines because they just didn't meet our quality standards. So uh, not that we don't love all of you, we just don't have as much wine in the 17 vintage. So if you're interested in keeping your vertical going or acquiring some of these wines, uh, time is of the essence, get it now because by fall, um, the 17s will unfortunately be gone. Yeah. And 18s next year, which are really good too. That brings in a great point about 17 at Cade. I remember uh, the fires were raging. I was delivering some pizzas, because that's what we do when things go wrong. We bring food. Um, drop five pizzas off here for you. Had my mask on. And I drove up with pizzas for Danielle Sorrow and her crew. And I remember breaking through what is typically the fog line. Um, and it was also became the smoke line. And above that uh, altitude, it was blue skies and breezy. So Danielle did not suffer the same challenges up on Howe Mountain that Plump Jack and Odette did in 17. And we're grateful for that, for sure. So that's evidence as well in the 17 reserve that's uh, just becoming available. Any other questions? Come see us when this is all behind. You're welcome, your family, your friends. Um, thank you for your support. Um, we look forward to drinking too much wine with you here at Plump Jack <laughs> Kid or yeah, Odette. Hopefully keep our fingers crossed late summer. Um, we're looking always for people to help us harvest pig grapes. It's fun for about 20 minutes and we pay in wine. So we invite you to come help us, but uh, stay safe, uh, drink wine, and we look forward to our next meeting. And I want to say thank you, John, for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron, for your expertise. And uh, really thank you guys, because as I've said every week on Friday, we don't get to do this without you guys. Cheers. <laughs>